This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. This is No Small Endeavor. I'm Lee C. Camp. You're listening to our unabridged interview with poet Naomi Shihab Nye. I don't get to become friends with all of our guests, but there is a lovely handful I've had opportunity to stay in touch with, and one of those is Naomi Naomi is a delightful human being, a wonderful poet, and she has enough in her DNA and life experience that has known the pain of human history. She's Palestinian-American. She grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, and lives now in San Antonio, Texas, all facts which point to historic pain and tragedy. And yet, Naomi is a joyful delight whom I've always enjoyed working with or visiting with. This was taped for an online show we did during the pandemic in 2020, so the memories of my lovely conversation with Naomi during those months and months of isolation is a special memory. Enjoy. Naomi Shahab Nye describes herself as a wandering poet, says spent 40 years traveling the country and the world, leading writing workshops, inspiring students of all ages. Naomi was born to a Palestinian father and an American mother, grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, also lived in Jerusalem and San Antonio. Drawing on her Palestinian-American heritage, cultural diversity of her home in Texas, and her experiences traveling throughout Asia, Europe, Canada, Mexico, Middle East, and I I think South America was prominent in uh, perhaps honeymoon days, Nye uses her writing to attest to our shared humanity. And we got to do a token show together uh, last year, I think it was, in Lubbock, Texas. Great to be with you again, Naomi. Lee, I'm so happy to be with you by any means possible. <laughs> and you're there. You're there at your home in uh, in San Antonio, right downtown San Antonio, Texas, near the river. Uh, sending you good wishes from here. Yes, delightful, delightful to get to be with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, Naomi's also the recipient of more. I started looking at all of the awards you've received, and it's kind of more, as we would say in Alabama, it's more than you can shake a stick at. And uh, but perhaps uh, very prominently recently named the Young Poets Laureate uh, uh, by the Poetry Association. So and also um, professor of creative writing at uh, Texas State University. So it's yes. great to again great to be with you. I'm I'm fascinated. One of the things that we talk a lot about on this podcast are practices for human flourishing. That is um, because my 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 field and. In ethics, I've done a lot of reading and teaching in virtue ethics. And so one of the things that Mm. virtue traditions talk about are finding these practices and employing practices that help us flourish as human beings. And it seems to me that you're you're perhaps the great practice you point to for us in learning to flourish as human beings is simply the act of writing. Is that you think that's a fair thing to say? I I do think it's fair, and I love the word practice, so Mm. I'm very happy that you emphasize that word. I think it's a simple word that often doesn't get the respect it's due, because I think practice will give us so much more grounding and possible wisdom or insight. Uh, It's not just some, some kind of drudgery that we assign to ourselves. I was just asking a writer last week whom I admire very much how she had come to write a certain piece. And it was a nonfiction piece, and normally she writes poetry. And she said, it took a lot of research and ritual. And I love that, because I think that's what practice gives us time for and ability for. Um, Looking at what we do, having a regularity about our tending to our art or our craft, uh, and the ritual or practice is very welcoming to new ideas and to discovery. I do think that that's one of the things that I've discovered um, in my writing through the years is that it is simply showing up and doing the work. And uh, the the sorts of eureka moments typically don't come. uh, Sometimes they'll come, you know, in the shower or on a drive. But for me, a lot of times uh, breakthroughs happen when I've I didn't want to write that day and I sit down and I write and then all of a sudden a half hour, 45 minutes in, I I'm discovered something that I wouldn't have discovered if I just hadn't started doing the act itself or the ritual itself. 
you have just said the magic formula. You, <laughs> you were ready for it. You were open to it. You started even though maybe you didn't want to. And then something was allowed to come through that door. Um, you have to open the door. And I think yeah. sometimes practice is simply gathering yourself together, sitting down at your table, if you're a writer, and being open and starting anywhere, starting with what's nearest and dearest in your heart and mind, what you're worried about at the moment, asking your questions. Uh, that's how you begin. And that's yeah. how things come to us. Yeah. I, I like the way in which you you seem to have repeatedly talked about how your own writing helps you pay attention. Yes. Um, and that... Um, and it goes back to that, uh, that the poem that you have. Please describe how you became a writer. Um, that uh, and it, it, the line is something like, um, "You took refuge from your insulting first grade textbook. Come, Jane. Come, look, Dick. Look. Were there ever duller people in the world? You had to tell them to look at things." <laughs> and I just, yeah. But talk a little bit about that. About this sort of uh, importance of paying attention. Yeah, and that last line is, why weren't they looking to begin with? Yes. You know, it always seemed to me, even as a child, that people weren't curious enough. Yeah. Uh, what were they waiting for? Why did they want to be entertained all the time? Why weren't they just staring a little harder, putting things together a little more interesting way, and coming up with their own new thoughts or new possibilities? So uh, I was always... Um, very attentive as a little child. I, I got in trouble in school a lot for what the teachers <laughs> called daydreaming. But now I would think I was in trouble for having imaginative thoughts. I was sitting there <laughs> staring, and it wasn't like I was trying to be rude to the lesson, but sometimes the lesson was just too dull to focus on very long. So my mind would start spinning out and putting new things together. Huh. Uh, looking back at old school notebooks, Recently, I found even, you know, little beginnings of poems in all the margins of my pages. And um, my mind was just always curious about words that were floating in the air, what was outside the window, what did someone say that no one else seemed to pay attention to, Yeah. what did I need to remember from yesterday before it left me forever. Um, I think I was already a very nostalgic person, even when I was a little child. Hmm. I was always thinking about precious yesterday. What happened yesterday? I'll hmm. never see yesterday again. So there was some kind of um, appetite for remembrance in me as a child. I mean, who can say where that comes from? I don't know. But I had it in an acute way, and I've basically carried that along all through my life. And writing has really helped me to realize how rich we all are in experiences, even when we go months and don't travel anywhere, uh, even when we're hardly leaving our home place. Yeah. Um, there's so much to think about and so much to look at and yeah. so many ways you could try reaching out or having a new thought. Yeah. That relates to uh, a, a line which I think you picked up from another poet, um, but I found in my notes from when I was with you in Lubbock, um, but you, you quoted this line that said, to me, poetry is someone standing up, so to speak, and saying with as little concealment as possible what it is for him or her to be on earth at this moment. Mm. Um, I find that that so is, Yeah, from Galway Canal. Okay. Yes. Uh, an Irish poet, right? Yes, Irish American poet, great poet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, talk to us a little bit more about that. What's that? What's that kind of connote for you? Well, that that suggests that um, the line of standing up and saying what it is to be alive at this moment. Uh, for one thing, we're so lucky to be alive at mm -hmm. this moment, and uh, paying attention to that reality, but also. Uh, feeling comfortable describing at any given moment what we're going through, whether it's worry or panic or regret or um, anticipation or disappointment, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be sheer happiness and you know exaltation. Mm -hmm. It could be any human emotion, but feeling comfortable describing it because that's really how human beings mix and mingle in this world and how we learn from one another and how we find our friends and how we do everything 
uh, involved with learning and living. So, you know, one thing I've always been trying to do with kids is help them realize how much material they already have. I'll tell them, you're so rich hmm. with images, memories, ideas. And I love how kids will stare back at you if you say, you're so rich. Because too many <laughs> times, rich is a word only connected with, with money and stuff and um, a certain kind of lifestyle. But yeah. when you say to someone, you know, how many memories do you have? How many things have you lost already? How much do you miss how much do you dream about? That's what I'm talking about when I talk mm. about richness. And, you know, I was always interested as a child in living a big life. I remember having that as a concept in my mind. I don't want to live a small, little, fearful life where I'm just huddled in a corner worried about everything. Yeah. I want to find out what's going on with my neighbors. I want to meet those people down the block who just moved here from Canada or Italy, or, you know, I wanna go take a job on the farm so I can get to have young black boys as my friends. Mm. And remember, I grew up in Ferguson and it was a segregated community at that time. So that's where we met at the farm. We all worked there together. Huh. And um, I was always thinking in those terms, how do I make my life bigger? Or how does life, expand to take a full deep breath every day so you're not just living in a sad little box by yourself. Now, maybe it helped that I had an immigrant father who was always talking about a beloved place I had never seen yet. I wouldn't see Palestine till I was 14 years old when we moved and lived there for a year. I wouldn't meet my Palestinian grandmother till I was a teenager. And so when you're hearing all through your childhood of this deep, precious world that belongs to your very, very beloved parent, um, that changes you. And also, I think I was very lucky that my mother was an artist. She really felt that art had saved her own life. Hmm. And she took us to the St. Louis Art Museum probably every Sunday afternoon of my entire childhood. Oh, we wow. had lunch there every Sunday, even though we didn't have much money. Um, I always ordered the same thing every Sunday, <laughs> fruit plate. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's weird to remember that fruit plate. I could I could concoct one that looks exactly like the <laughs> St. Louis Art Museum fruit plate tomorrow. But um, I was given the gift of looking at art from early childhood on and having my mother's beautiful guiding voice, which thankfully is still in my life, um, saying, what do you see? Uh, what does that make you think about? Uh, yeah. Pick your favorite painting in this room. Uh, do you like any of these sculptures? She would ask these open-ended questions about art, which really gave me agency as a child. Like, my opinion matters. My mom wants to know which painting I like best. Hmm. Uh, Matisse is now my personal friend. Um, <laughs> you know, I found out early that I was wildly in love with the painter Paul Clay from Switzerland. Huh. And later, on a family journey, to go to the Swiss village my ancestors had come from on my mother's side. Um, I went to the Paul Clay Museum, I went to his town, and huh. it was incredible because I felt like Paul Clay has been my personal friend my entire life. And all I've ever owned of his is a postcard. But because wow. I love him so much, and I read about him, and I thought about him, and I know his nickname was The Little Arab, I always <laughs> felt close to him. And um, so, you know, I think, Lee, that we're lucky if we have people in our lives who are willing to try to expand us yeah. in whatever way. And I know this happens for so many people with music because you hear so many musicians talk about, well, my parents listened to all kinds of music right. or we always had this certain kind of music going in my house. My yeah. mother loved black gospel music. So huh. we had like Marian Anderson, Mahalia Jackson, Paul Robeson. We had all these um, black artists who were part of our daily soundtrack in our huh. house. And I know that marked me in terms of music I love and yeah. ways of listening. You get, yeah, you've, you actually gave me some new language, I think, to think about 
one of the things I've said in my teaching for years, uh, I'll tell my students sometimes, that, and so, you know, you, you might come to this class, you might come to this theology class or this ethics class looking for answers, but I'm really more interested in giving you good enough questions that you can take with you the rest of your life. And, and I think I, I heard that hooking up with um, the gift of giving someone, your parents giving you, for example, the gift of learning how to pay attention. And I think that's what a good question does, right? It just, it, it allows us to pay attention to certain things we might not pay attention to otherwise. You're so rightly, it opens the door. A good question opens a door of thinking. And then all kinds of images and possibilities can come yeah. in. And yeah. I feel your students are so lucky to get to have you asking them, uh, to think in that way. I was a religion major in college and I, heard that. I loved theological study and I loved all the different questions that come to us along the different paths of study and uh, devotion and theory and um, So when you yes. when you think back to your um it was comparative religions I think you did. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. So when you look back to a comparative religions work um what do you think would be some of the key uh, questions, key lenses that you got through that uh, discipline of study that you've carried with you that have helped you pay attention to certain things? Well, luckily, my parents were both very ecumenical in their ways of thinking. Neither one of them practiced uh, the religions of their parents or their grandparents uh, officially. They um, respected them. My father's family was Muslim. My mother's family was Lutheran Christian. Um, and uh, my father had told his mother when he was 12 years old, he didn't want to practice and be a practicing Muslim, mm. but he would respect Islam all his life. My mother had a bit of a harder time with her family mm. um, because they wanted to reject her open-mindedness, whereas my father's family did not. Mm. Uh, so they were committed, mutually committed to raising their children as ecumenical thinkers. And these are some things that I learned as a religion major that my, that I got first from my parents. There is truth in every path. Um, it is always important to treat others as you would like to be treated. Always respect others. There is some great spirit, whether we call it God or Allah or Buddha or the great spirit of the Native American traditions, uh, Yahweh, whatever we call uh, God, there is some great spirit abiding from which we all came. Um, respect that idea even if you don't want to apply a particular name to yourself of what it is you practice. Um, I was lucky to be raised in such an open-hearted home. Um, my mother sent us to Bible school as children because mm. in the summers because she felt it was very important to know the Bible, to know Bible stories. When somebody talked about things that happened in the Bible, you know, she didn't want us gazing off into space having no yeah. idea <laughs> what they were talking about. So, uh, and my father to told us about the tenets of Islam. Uh, I was very attracted to uh, Sufism, which is a mystical branch of Islam, right. and Zen Buddhism, particularly for myself. But I was also attracted to mystical Christianity, and these were things I tried to study and kind of bring together um, as a student. And certainly they all ask basic questions, all the religions, like, how might we treat one another better? Yeah. How might we take get better care of one another? Well, what do I do to be the best human being, uh, honoring the universe we spring from? How can I be an honest person in everything I do? You know, how do I learn how to respect people who aren't just like me? Um, if someone else is very closed-minded and tells me there is only one way of salvation, how do I respond to that? How can I embrace their passion and their belief without feeling insulted by it or telling mm -hmm. them they're ridiculous? You know, there's always more to learn. I'm still working with these things. You know, yeah. and I think many of the things, many of the questions that I asked as a student of comparative religions are some of the same questions I ask these days regarding politics, society, yeah. community, how do we become better global citizens? 
How do we care about everybody in our city? Right. How do we reach out beyond um, our little group of friends and neighbors we feel comfortable with? No. You know, Poetry the, helps us ask those questions too. Yeah. Hearing you describe uh, those particular themes that come from a variety of uh, traditions, um, and then also hearing you describe the way you wrote um, your poem Kindness as, as if it just kind of came to you, and you were more the recipient of it, I think I've heard you say, than, than, the, than the writer of it. That doesn't surprise me now, given all of those things that you just said. But will you tell us a little bit about the background story of that particular poem and kind of what your experience was of receiving it and then maybe share that with us? Yes, thank you, Lee. Um, kindness has been the poem of mine, which people ask for the most uh, to reprint it or to use it here and there, which touches me very much because I really do not feel like the author of this poem. Mm. I feel that I was a scribe and I wrote the words down as I heard them. I heard them spoken by a woman's voice across a public plaza in the colonial town of Popayan, Colombia. Uh, my husband and I, we were on our honeymoon. We had barely been married a week yet. <laughs> um, we had just suffered the most traumatic experience of both of our lives till that time. We were robbed of everything we had on a bus. And also we had witnessed a murder of someone else, an Indian man on the bus, mm. who didn't have anything for the robbers to steal. Oh. And so out of retaliation, they just killed him. And um, it was terrifying. We didn't know what to do next. I was sitting quite traumatized back in the town we had come from. And a man had addressed us in a kind voice in Spanish, asking us what happened to us. He could tell we were disheveled and strangers to the town. And we had tried in our pitiful Spanish to explain it to him. And he nodded sadly and said he was sorry, went on his way. And the word kindness came into my mind. Mm. That man was kind. He was sorry for us. And then the poem was spoken to me. And because I still had a little tablet in my pocket and a pencil, I scribbled it down trying to keep up with the voice I was hearing. Hmm. Uh, and the voice really felt as if it was floating in the trees across the plaza. Hmm. And the poem would change very little. Only a couple of words would change. Hmm. But I copied it down just as I heard it. Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you. He too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness, as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. 
That's so beautiful. Thank you, Naomi. That's a, that's a great gift to the world right there. Thank you. Thank you um, for listening to it. Um, it is a great comfort sometimes in life to be willing to listen to what's given to us. And whether it's a voice through prayer that speaks back to us or the voice of an angel or a muse or a mysterious spirit who came to me right when I needed her or a sleeping part of my own imagination, as the poet Philip Levine used to say, that's what the muse is. It's just a part of your own imagination, yeah. speaking out of your unconscious. Who knows? But I felt very calmed after I finished writing those words down. And I also felt as if I knew what to do next. Hmm. And that's one of the problems sometimes when you have a great trauma, is you just don't know what to do right. next. Yeah. I. I'm fascinated with the juxtaposition in that poem between um, kindness and great grief, uh, great tragedy, great pain. Um, and that seems to be one of the things I see, uh, a theme that surfaces repeatedly in a number of your writings. Um, mm. And it's, it just seems so true to my own experience, right, that, that um, I remember our college president when I was an undergrad, um, you know, I listened to lots of chapel speeches during those years, but um, his was one of the few I remember, and, and it was a very simple little bit of wisdom, and um, he, he he told stories, and in the midst of telling those stories, he would say, life gets better and better and harder and harder. And, wow. um And I always, I've just, you know, I've carried that with me now for 30, I don't know, I forget how many years it's been now, 30 32, three, four years now. Um, but that mm. sort of holding together that that uh, here you have kindness and loss or ha uh, with you all other places, um, happiness and loss or happiness and pain. Um, but um, how, how, how have you seen that kind of surface in your own work in repeated ways? Or why do you think? I, I, is it just simply life right. experience that's, that's uh, prompted that in your work? Well, you know, often I really am thinking about his comment, better and better and harder and harder, because often when we have a very hard time, uh, there's also a sense of uh, almost emptiness that comes to us. We feel, mm -hmm. we feel empty of our enthusiasm, for example, or our energy after a very hard, sad, difficult, a grief or a trauma, a terrible time, we're just empty. And sometimes being that empty vessel is necessary so that we could have uh, some new refreshment, some new insight, some new understanding about the world be given to us. Yeah. And I think probably many practices and traditions would suggest that, that sometimes we're so full of ourselves, uh, how would we have room to have a new, interesting, creative thought? But yeah. if we're empty of ourselves and all our previous convictions, and if we're in a very hard time, then often something will be given, if, if we're open to it. Yeah. And, and I do recall with great love a writer from Texas, William Goyen, uh, who used to say when people asked him where his stories and novels began, he smiled and he said, ah, they always start with trouble. <laughs> Usually I think of something I still haven't quite worked out or some deep trouble I've been through in my life. And that's where the story begins because yeah. I'm still trying to work on that thing. I'm still right. trying to understand something about it. And, you know, he said, if, if it's a story of happiness and you feel fine, perfection, uh, the story might not be as interesting. Yeah. But when there's trouble or emptiness, yeah. then something may come. Yeah, that, that reminds me of, uh, I, I'd written a few lines from your different ways to pray. The shepherds raise their arms, hear us, we have pain on earth, we have so much pain, there's no place to store it. And then a number near the end, at night, the men ate heartily flat bread and white cheese and were happy in spite of the pain because there was also happiness. Mm. And that, that's, a, that's a sweet juxtaposition. And I think, I think in your paying attention in that way and helping others 
people pay attention to that possibility. It it actually engenders the possibility of happiness in the midst of pain in uh, in beautiful ways, I think. I'm very grateful to you for picking out those lines because mm. I really love those lines. And in some ways for me, I, I love the lines because they remind me of Palestinian people yeah, I bet. or say Mexican-American people. I live near the Mexican border here in San Antonio. Yeah. And um, you're very conscious of like collective groups of people who suffer a lot during certain periods of history. And I've always felt as if Palestinians were somehow the funniest people on earth, the most comedic. <laughs> they have a fantastic, sharp, witty sense of humor. Yes. And also all my beloved Mexican-American neighbors in San Antonio, I I feel that they have such access to beautiful humor on a daily basis, even though we're all aware of this trauma of the border right. that we dislike tremendously that's going yeah. on so near us. Um, so because Palestinian people have suffered a lot, because Latinx people have suffered so much, there's, um, there's a sense of proximity to affection for life yeah. or enjoying the flatbread and the white cheese. Because yeah. look, we better, because what else do we have? We're right. right here. We have to be present in our bodies. Uh, things are tough, but we're also going to treasure our lives. Yeah. And if we could only realize that about others always, how would the world be different? Yeah. The um, Your own experience, uh, the diversity of your cultural experiences, going back to your your parents' different, uh, sharply different um religious and cultural traditions and then that as a consequence of that or at least part of the consequence of that being you getting to live in such different places and travel to such different places we talked to us a little bit out of that about learning to appreciate uh, cultural diversity um sure. and kind of how you might see that as a particular yeah. particularly important human practice for being kind Wow, thank you for that question, Lee. You know, at this moment in our national history, for example, uh, it's curious to think about uh, people wanting to bend together in sort of a tribal fashion, like mm -hmm. us and them, or this is for our group, this is what we believe, um, but that's what they believe. And, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where that impulse comes from because to me, mixtures have always been interesting. And, you know, to be around people who are not exactly like me, it's much more interesting than just being with a bunch of my fellow Arab American writers. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cozy and I love them. But I also like to be with people of such diversity and different background, different experience. Um, or see movies or read novels in which we have a chance to enter into that other world. And yeah. in all the years I've been traveling, you know, everywhere, a lot of places, uh, to work with poetry and kids and community, I used to laugh thinking, wow, now even the smallest town in the United States has a Thai restaurant. That has to be good <laughs> because that means the people in this tiny town get to expand their palates. Yes. And so in some little way, they respect Thailand because look how many people are here eating tonight. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just think every time we get to share uh, cultural details of a world that is not exactly matching of ours, we're a little bigger people. So for yeah. me, that goes back to childhood. I want to have a big life. And we don't have to share all of the same, you know, exact principles about everything. You know, what one person thinks about health insurance and what another person thinks about health insurance. Well, ultimately, um, we're human beings and we hope we don't get sick. And if we do get sick, we hope there's a way to be taken care of right. that we can pay for or be paid for somehow. So, you know, we should keep focusing on those larger things which bind us together as human beings and stop you know, pointing the fist, pointing the gun, pointing whatever to uh, separate from one another. Because really, I don't think that serves us in the biggest picture as human beings. And I think it's kind of embarrassing. It's embarrassing for towns and and for states if they start trying to develop a persona like we're different from you crossing the border to your state. You know, as a Texan, and I do identify with Texas a lot since I've lived here the longest, um, although I wasn't born here and didn't grow up here. Um, I feel like I've had to defend Texas 
a lot in other American states because people <laughs> say mean things about Texas. You know, I guarantee they don't say as mean things about Tennessee as they do about Texas. But uh, this is oh, a but, state. But, but they do Alabama, which is my home. They do my home about state. Alabama. Yeah. Maybe yeah. so. <laughs> my favorite project in architecture is Rural Studio. That comes out of Alabama. Huh. I'll stand up for that everywhere. Yeah. But, you know, we have to just witness one another as as human beings yeah. and all the little labels that get applied to us, urban, rural, north, south, all this stuff, um, you know, whatever our ethnic background is, whatever yeah. our job is, uh, ultimately that's not the most important yeah. thing. Uh, that, that reminds me, and I've, I've, I'm probably butchered this quotation, but uh, uh, St. Augustine said, had some line where he said something like, um, the world is a book, and those who do not travel read only one page. Wow. And um, learning to appreciate the beauty. And that goes back as well to what you said earlier about wanting to live a large life, um, which reminded me of, you know, the Aristotelian virtue of magnanimity. Is, you, know, you, want, you want something uh, large, and you want uh, large not in the sense of ego, but large in the sense of a- accepting the beauty and the diversity and the wonder of life and uh, – and, and, and too, I, I see how that connects in your own life with learning to pay attention, because I don't think without, I think without paying attention, we really can't even begin to appreciate the beauty that comes from us, comes to us through such diverse experiences. So I love all the way I hear all of that connect. Uh, well, in you. I just love everything you've just said. And that magnanimous spirit also has to be, we have to like do like a selfie picture. We have to apply it to our own lives. We have to be magnanimous to our own experience. Yeah, yeah. It is valuable experience. It's what we have. And even if we never traveled anywhere, like I think of Henry David Thoreau, the great transcendentalist writer, um, whom I was madly in love with when I was a high school student, (laughs) uh, went to Walden Pond, walked around the whole pond, stood in front of his desk with tears running down my cheeks. Um, (laughs) But I think of... I think of Thoreau, who used to have a lot of suspicion about travel. And he said, we need to enter into our own backyards. We Mm. need to enter into the forest that's closest to our house and really get to know it. And he felt, even at his time of life, like back in the 1860s, that people were not paying close enough attention and this is incredible to think about now, right. to what was right next to them, to yeah. the plants, to the animals, to the light. And he used to say, you know, go outside your door and bend down in the grass and look at yeah. every little thing. And so I think that's another kind of generosity we have to give ourselves, reminding ourselves you can dig in the dirt right where you are and find more to think about than what you've thought about till now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love that as well. I think that um, one of the things I've loved about the place I live here in Nashville um, is sitting on my front porch. I've seen and spending hours on my front porch reading or meditating or being still uh, or writing. Um, I've seen all sorts of amazing things um, yeah. sitting on that front porch from foxes to coyotes to deer. And I'm in the middle of middle of Nashville, you know. Um, or to parents with children uh, walking and talking and teaching. Uh, or sitting in my study here, there's a, an old flowering shrub that sits right outside the window that's behind my desk. And um, I wish you could see right now the multiplicity of bumblebees. And oh. um, just while we've been talking, the hummingbird that's come up to that, that, that I see at least once a day that comes to visit, you know. And um, the, the, the beauty that's present to us, if we'll just pay attention, is really overwhelming. I love your descriptions. I love looking out your window at your bush and the bees and the bird. And I feel exactly the same. You know, I always tell kids how much we have that we don't have to own. Right. You know, I don't own the moon, but I trust it. Yeah. I don't own those trees in the park across the street but I look at them every day and I have a personal relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, I've grown attached through the months of pandemic to watching one man whom I never met before uh, and, and train. he's training tricks to his one dog and I've learned their <laughs> names. We call out to each other across the street and I'm not even a dog person, but I am, I'm a cat person, but I am so impressed by this dog, how much it has learned <laughs> over the past uh, few months. And I feel, you know, very... 
uh, touched by them, like they're part of my world now, even though we've never stood on the same side of the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. So much is out there. Just yes. watch it. Yeah. Um, another another point we've got that um, uh, you shared with the world that I love is um, Gate A4. Uh, that's another one of these beautiful exhibitions of kindness. But would you tell us a little, maybe the background of that and share that one with us? Sure. The, um, Gate A4 is an anecdotal poem, which means, and it's really written as a prose poem, so it looks like little chunky paragraphs on the page. It really happened in the Albuquerque airport. Every mm. time I go there now, I take a deep bow in front of Gate A4. <laughs> um, and uh, the on my only mistake, I feel, in this piece was I did not get the woman's address mm. uh, so that I could send her the piece. But even as it was unfolding, I started feeling it as a story. And by the time she got off the airplane, I knew it was something I had to write. And I started writing it immediately. So huh. I would get every little detail correct. I didn't want to forget any little bit of it. Yeah. Shall I read it? Please. That would be great. Gate A4. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been detained four hours, I heard an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of Gate A4 understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. <laughs> well... One pauses these days. Gate A4 was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing. Help, said the flight agent. Talk to her. What is her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late, and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke haltingly. Shu dawa, shu biddik habibdi, stand this way, min fadlik, shu bitsawi. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been canceled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, you're fine, you'll get there. Who's picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son. I spoke with him in English, saying I would stay with his mother till we got on the plane. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for fun. <laughs> then we called my dad. And he <laughs> and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had 10 shared friends. <laughs> then I thought... Just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her? This all took up two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She had pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts from her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. Mm. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo, we were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling, there is no better cookie. And then the airline broke out free apple juice from huge coolers, and two little girls from our flight ran around serving it, and they were covered with powdered sugar, too. <laughs> and I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves. Such an old country traveling tradition. Always carry a plant. Always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in, the shared world. Not a single person in that gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug 
all those other women too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. That, um, as I was listening to that, I, I could not help but be reminded of the fact that it was the Hebrew prophets, um, later Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 65, who describes new heavens and new earth, and, and he does it in poetry. And um, I think you give us a glimpse of, the, as you say there, the, the world in which you want to live, which is, mm. of course, the, you know, one, one, one possible way to think about the meaning of hope and the theological meaning of hope is to anticipate a world that we want to live in. So thank you. That's so, so beautiful. You indicated you had one or two other, uh, one or two other poems you might want to yes, share about and since uh, kindness. I'll read two very short poems. And since the pandemic, I think we're all hungry for hugs and shaking hands with people and, um, you know, encountering the stranger and not shying away from like, get back, please don't be too close to me. Um, and the idea of right now of taking a food that someone hands you with their hand and just instantly consuming it seems like an exotic, yeah. <laughs> a long ago thing that we could do. But hopefully yeah. someday we'll be able to do that again. So yeah. I thought I would read two very, very incidental poems. You know, yeah. a life is full of lots of tiny moments. And those are the moments that I think sometimes we just want to pay greater attention to. So the first one has a quote from our grandson in it. He was two when he said this, but right now he's four. And I could be a full-time poet just writing about him and things he says <laughs> because he speaks poetry every, every other minute. So this is a very short poem. And it was written spontaneously in a poetry project for someone um, called Window. Hope makes itself every day, springs up from the tiniest places. No one gives it to us. We just notice it. Quiet in the small moment. The two-year-old kissing the window, he said, because someone he loved was out there. How lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very powerful moment. Oh, that's and, so wonderful. Um, and we took him when he was three on his first flight. He was so excited to be in an airplane. And he kept saying things like, I'm over everybody. All the cars are so tiny now. Look at the little tiny houses and, you know, all the thoughts that you yeah. forget about when you fly frequently. Yes. But we took him to the beach in Miami and uh, there was so much exhilaration for him in those beautiful waves at sunset. And so um, this is a little incidental poem called Blue River of Florida Light. And I send this out to the beautiful state of Florida. Your state and our state has had a hard time during the mm. pandemic. And uh, we send you a lot of hopes for healing. Please send some to us too. Blue River of Florida Light. To fall into a day. Wide horizon every day of a life. Nothing stops moving or changing ever. Sea swallows all our mutterings. Who did you hope to meet? What were you looking for? Some dreams had tight hymns, but not here. You couldn't tell which way the laughter was blowing. Mm. Sometimes I try to write a poem that just recreates a slim moment. You know, like the feeling of joy that you feel when you're with a child and you're just putting your arms up on a beach. And um, it's, life is full of those moments. Yeah. And Henry David Thoreau used to say, to watch the sun rise or go down every day, one or the other, would keep a person sane hmm. forever. And those yeah, are the and kinds of moments we look for with poetry, with prayer. Yeah, and he goes back to the, um recent um, studies that have been done in kind of experimental psychology about uh, one, one variable that they've identified that correlates with with joy or with happiness is simply learning to pay attention 
to whatever whatever moment we're in and uh and again that goes back to this 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 kind of thread that's been through our whole conversation today and we certainly see it in your poetry and uh that's so wonderful so wonderful to hear that i think that's the truth and it's the hinge and it's the pivot too it's right. the pivot for all the moments when we feel overwhelmed or you know the to do the to do list is too long just pivot back to some kind of attention. Mm. Um, I wanted to mention, Lee, that today I'm reading for the first time ever out of uh, my brand new book of new and selected poems called Everything Comes Next. Mm. And it is gorgeously illustrated by uh, Rafael Lopez. And I think it's the most beautiful artwork ever on a cover. Huh. And um, I'm very honored that this book has come out with an introduction by Edward Hirsch, an American mm. poet I respect so much. And um, this is the first time I've ever held it in my hands wow. and read from it. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the new book. Thank you. Well, we've been talking with Naomi Shihab Nye, a Palestinian-American poet, uh, young people's poet laureate from her home in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, has brought us numerous gifts today. Thank you, Naomi, so much for your time. Lee, thank you for all the music and all the wisdom you share with the world. You make every place you are better. <laughs> thank you. Peace to you. Peace. As we near the 2024 U.S. presidential election, you might be interested in diving deeper into all things religion and politics while still being entertained. And if this sounds like you, then you should check out the award-winning history podcast, Truce. Truce presses pause on the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. In its newest season, Truce examines the connection between some evangelicals and the Republican Party with the help of world-class historians like Rick Perlstein and Francis Fitzgerald. Follow Truce on your favorite podcast app or listen to it at trucepodcast.com. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Sheasley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX, Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studio. Oh.